Welcome. We are going to be talking today to John Cox. I'm really looking forward to that. The first thing I'd like to do, though, before we start anything, is to read the land acknowledgement for the area. On behalf of North Seattle College, we acknowledge that we occupy the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe, a people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. Thank you. I'm gonna start out with a um, intro. So welcome. Uh, in such a time where we're kept in place at a necessity, a lovely byproduct of this, of this is that we can take advantage of the technology to have people who are not in our local community come to speak to us. For the next couple of quarters, the NSC Art Gallery has built a visiting artist lecture series around bringing in artists from around the country. Today we begin this series. It is such a privilege to introduce to you today's visiting artist, John Hitchcock. I've known John since 2001 when he began teaching at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I got my MFA. He's an incredible artist, musician, human whose ready answer is yes, which is what has brought him to be with us today. Uh, John Hitchcock earned his BFA from Cameron University in Lawton, Oklahoma and his MFA in printmaking and photography at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. He's a professor of art and associate de dean of arts at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is a prolific and award-winning artist. John Hitchcock has been the recipient of many awards, including the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation Artistic Innovation and Collaborative Grant, Jerome Foundation Grant, the Creative Arts Award, Emily Mead Baldwin Award in the Creative Arts, and the Kellett Mid-Career Award at the University of Wisconsin. He has held residencies at Crow's Shadow Institute for the Arts in Pendleton, Oregon, the Plains Indian Museum in Cody, Wyoming, the Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota, the Matrix Press at the University of Montana, Missoula, Venice Printmaking Studio in Venice, Italy, Franz Mazaril Centrum uh, of Graphics in Belgium, Proyecto Ace in Buenos Aires, Argentina and more, <laughs> much more. Uh, Hitchcock's artwork has been exhibited at numerous venues, both nationally and internationally, including the Portland Art Museum in Portland, Oregon, where he currently has a solo show that is up through March of 2021. The Chazen Art Museum in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Madison Museum of Contemporary Art, the Missoula Art Museum in Missoula, Montana, Till Richter Museum for Contemporary Art in Bugenhagen, Germany, the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Rauschenberg Project Space in uh, New York, the American Culture Center in Shanghai, China, Mulvane Art Museum in Topeka, Kansas, Plains Art Museum, and so many, many more. Um, I'm just going to read a really quick part from his bio. John Hitchcock uses the print medium with its long history of commenting on social and political issues to explore his relationships to community, land, and culture. Hitchcock's artwork consists of mythological hybrid creatures, buffalo, owl, horse, deer, and military weaponry, tanks, bombs, and helicopters based on his childhood memories and stories of growing up in the Wichita mountains of Oklahoma on Comanche tribal lands next to the U.S. Field Artillery Military Base Fort Sill. Many of the images are interpretations of stories told by his Kiowa Comanche grandparents and abstract representations influenced by beadwork, land, and culture. I'm going to give you to John, but right before that, I just want you to know that if you have questions as they come up, please put them in the chat. And if it's okay, John, I will um, sort of interrupt you with them as, and as it goes, if, if, it, if it works for you. Yeah, whatever, however you want to flow, I'm ready to go. We can do it. Okay. Yeah, good. Here you go. Thank you yeah. so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. I totally appreciate it. And I, like I, Amanda said, I've known Amanda since uh, coming to Madison, Wisconsin in 2001. And it was a unique moment coming here. Then um, my first day of teaching happened. The second day, 9-11 happened. And after that, life just switched. And I remember Francis Myers, the professor there, said, 
welcome to the beginning of the rest of your life. And I was like, and it just frantically everyone running up and down the halls. Amanda was one me to all of us going, what are we doing here? What, how do we operate? How do we function? And how do we get into these studios? So I th thank you for, for the introduction and also thank you, uh, North Seattle College and the gallery and, and everyone who's coming out. Thank you for being here. So what I'm going to do is just go right into the share screen and share a slideshow and start talking. And at any time, <clears throat> if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat, ask questions to me. We can figure it out. We can jump off the slide share, have conversation back and forth. But I'm going to get going. Is that cool? We good? All right. So let's see if this slide share action. All right, I did my thank yous. And so I'm gonna go right into a short, short video here to kind of sum up where I come from briefly in a video format, and then we'll go into the main talk. Let's see here. So, um, I grew up in Oklahoma, and that relationship of what you just saw is the relationship of indigenous land, uh, ideas of colonization, <clears throat> the reference to militarization, and that historical background of, of those lands, Comanche tribal lands, and the relationship to that. So, this is the Wichita Mountains. Um, so, historically... The Wichita Mountains are, they were established in 1901 as a refuge that was for grazing animals such as buffalo, longhorn, deer, and the incredibly beautiful place where I grew up. And so the, the interesting relationship between them is the militarization right across from the Wichita Mountains and Highway 49 separated my um, family's land, Comanche tribal lands, from Fort Sill, the U.S. military base. So those places were important to me because of the history and the history of, of the issues of colonization and, and, and how I didn't understand it as a kid. And as a kid, to me, it was unique because the, in the Wichita Mountains, there's this place called Easter, the Easter pageant, where the Easter pageant happened, it was, uh, it, was the, it was the longest running passion play called The Holy City. And as a kid in your upbringing, you're thinking like, well, what, what's this place? It's a re recreation of Jerusalem. And, and as kids, we'd go up and we'd like stand on the cross and, and act like we were Jesus. And it was like, what, 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 what is, it? you know, like questioning these questions of Christianity versus spirituality and versus this idea of um, the songs that my grandparents sing that were traditional Kiowa and Comanche songs. And so to me, seeing it on TV too, with, with, with anything related to Christianity, I thought like, this is exactly where like Jesus lived and this is where all these things happened, but it was this recreation. So it was this facsimile, facsimile that happened in my head, but actual land base. Um, again, Fort Sill, the Kiowas, Comanches, Apaches, the tribal lands in that location <clears throat> were a product of the militarization and the government and the U.S. government's relationship with Native people. And these helicopters are named after the same tribes, the Kiowa people, the St. Thaide. My grandfather's a direct descendant of St. Thaide. And so uh, the Comanches, the Isarosa people, my grandmother's side, she's a direct uh, descendant of the Isarosa people. And Apaches are uh, Geronimo, very famous Jericho Apache that was there in that region too and was forced um, to be there. I grew up going to these military, the military base, and at the military base, these gun walks and this reverence to the heritage of weaponry and violence and 
how that functioned. And my father worked at the military base. <clears throat> my grandfather worked on tanks and helicopters. My father ended up working, uh, pouring concrete his last day of work before he retired. He was, a, he was in the military at Fort Sill. That's how he ended up there and met my mother. But his last day, he poured concrete in the morning. And in the evening, he was an afternoon digging ditches and fixing fences. And, and so that work construction, getting things done mentality, and then that idea of the militarization and how it functioned. My grandmother was a really, uh, to me and grandfather, both of them were probably two of the, uh, the biggest influences on me because of my grandmother's in her beadwork and my grandfather sing at the drum. And she made these incredible beaded pieces that 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 I have today that I look at and and I did not realize until now at this older age how important what her um background of basically what she taught me about line and shape like I remember as a kid she'd be beating and and sh and I'd be she'd get, hand me a sketchbook and say sit over there and draw and so I'd be drawing and she'd say I want you to draw these patterns and designs and so when I was drawing from them the ones that she had, the, the types of moccasins and different beadworks, she would basically say, I want you to um, look at the line work and start to create and think about how line functions. And then she also said, I want you to go outside and draw flowers. And normally there was a, a rose patch. And so I'd draw from these roses. I'd come inside and then she would hand me a paper bag. She'd tear a piece of brown paper bag off and hand it to me and said, I want you to come up with the pattern. I'm like, I never asked, like, what do I draw? Because she would instantly say, I want you to make it up. And so this idea of, of thinking and conceptualizing and how do you think about as a creative was given to me in that sense from my grandmother and just the, the, her actions and the way that she functioned. And it's her in the background here. It's a little blurry picture. but And my grandfather sang at the drum. And so he sing intertribal songs, Kiowa songs, Comanche songs, and, and various songs that, that I would hear him singing. And so that was like an important aspect of learning about cadence and sound from both of them and the hymnals. So as a kid, uh, two things. My first gig, um, started playing guitar at age 15. And we were talking about this earlier, like I actually worked in a club in a bar at the back door as a bouncer um, before we everybody got here. We were talking about this and I, I have always felt like I'm this bouncer guy in situations all the way up to where I'm at now. I'm in a associate dean's position. I've, I'm in this role of always negotiating space. But during that time as a youth, I was playing in bands and I ended up working the back door of the clubs lithography was the first thing that I got turned into printmaking in undergrad right out of high school into litho. So these are for like 25, 30 years ago, a long time ago. And of course I'm, I'm a hard head. I don't give up. I'm still doing it. This is recent. <laughs> So noisy rock and roll and metal and country and Western. <laughs> so I, my first gig was actually at the powwow. My second one was at a country bar at age 15 playing uh, Sweet Home Alabama. So you went from Slayer to Sweet Home Alabama at a 15 year old, 14, 15 year old mind. All right, fast forward. We're into uh, post-grad school first big exhibition called Ritual Device. And, and a lot of the work I was doing at the time has to do with um, interactivity and the things learned from going to powwows, learned from the traditions of my grandparents and the idea of interactive na of, of, of the multiple. And so for me, printmaking was a, a, an instant way of using the multiple and thinking about how it functions. Also in the early part of my career, um, even before coming to Madison, I was working in grad school um, with commodity food items. And these commodity foods are foods that are distributed to uh, welfare programs, third world countries, 
to health programs. If you've gone to K through 12 uh, public, health, uh, public programs, public schooling, then you most likely have eaten this food. It's a U.S. government food. And so I was taking those images and putting, pulling the images off and looking at the graphics of them and how graphics function, um, changing the words to frozen ground fear instead of beef. Uh, today's what uh, Indigenous Day. So questioning this in, in, a long time ago, most of my life, like what, is, what does Columbus Day mean? And it says U.S. inspected and sold by the Department of Agriculture established in 1492. So those questions of the whole, the 100, 100% certified, what does that mean? There's, there's relationships of that and how that functions within culture and what is pure, what is purity, what are these things? And so this, this print is a um, screen print with gold dusted um, letterpress. So it's combined and it was done in Pennsylvania in 2004, quite a while, uh, quite a long time ago. And the thing about the installations early on was about the relationship of how I could function using this device, calling it the ritual device that you get to be a part of, but on some parts of it, you get a little piece of my politics in your pocket by me giving away something and honoring you. So I, was, I think I was talking about the commodities and the relationship to imaging and then having the opportunity to start to do these signage. This is in Darmstadt, Germany. And then in, and this was at Fort Lincoln. And so this was in front of a military base. And so I actually installed the same signage, which is still up at Fort Sill, across the street from Fort Sill, a military base, and it's on Comanche tribal lands. And so this background in the far background is my uh, grandparents' uh, dance ground. And so that's where I had that first gig in the far back area beyond the pond. And so this relationship of this was important because it's a personal, but it's also the political in terms of it facing Fort Sill. And so I was actually given a talk in uh, Quartz Mountain, Oklahoma. And I remember of someone raised their hand and talked about that relationship of the military and actually shooting those targets. And that was the whole idea of that relationship of this function of military militarization and uh, a target and the food being a target. So these types of action, this is when we reach 87 billion stop and this was done um, at University of North Texas in Denton. And it was at the time when George uh, Bush had asked for $87 billion to invade uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and to further the development of, of war and the function of that. And, and so we attempted as a group there, I worked with Catherine Siobhan at the time and Dustin Quinn, who was there. And we printed, I made a hundred little click mark check marks on one screen and we printed live and at the time I actually At the time I met um, Joseph Velasquez, who was in that video. He's uh, here in the corner over here and up here. And John Hancock, who's down here in the corner printing, is, was down in, uh, um, teach, he's teached in Texas, but Joseph was one of his students and he brought Joseph up to meet me. And, and weirdly enough, this whole process of, I wasn't thinking this, but this process of making these installations and these performative pieces and uh, became a, a, a way of networking and working with other artists and meeting young artists. And then Joseph ended up coming to grad school at, at, um, here in Madison and started Drive-By Press. So it was this first relationship situation from these political activities that started to do unique things for me to understand the language of what was going on in our communities and printmaking in particular. So this is more than a thousand at McAllister College in St. Paul with Ruth Ann Godali. And this was when a thousand soldiers had been announced had died in the uh, Iraq um, and in Afghanistan in the war situation. And so we wanted to repeat print the idea of what a thousand means, which is very different than the amount of what's dead now in COVID in this relationship. So there's a lot of artists that are doing pieces in relationship to that. And it's really painful to think about in terms of historically how situations occur and how artists 
you know, function and, and respond to them. Uh, another piece with uh, Dusty Herbig in Syracuse, and we basically took over a whole gallery. And in 24 hours, we printed, made a video, the video that played earlier with, and then we also did all of this all within one day and had the opening the next day. So, and then after that, my, my health issues declined severely for many different reasons, but that all nighter did it for me. I had a gallbladder, emergency gallbladder surgery after that. It just totally threw me in a whole other world. So this is the piece overall. Uh, collateral consumption, this was in Maryland. So these were very, they surround, they were in large scale spaces and they incorporated sound and video and, and giveaway components too. So this led to more external pieces now, and this is in Buenos Aires with Alicia Candiani and still dealing with the political and social activity. Uh, the, the, uh, the question was, is like I was using targets and so who's your target, who's targeting you? I got uh, 50 artists from South America and 50 artists from North America uh, from various backgrounds, age groups, and such to make work about this digitally. And the work was all submitted to me and I created these banners. So it was all done online. We never met fully until I actually went to Buenos Aires and we made these banners, printed them out on these large um, plastic sheets and we marched them up and down the streets, which uh, in Buenos Aires at the time, political protest was the norm already in certain circumstances. So this was almost a unique situation of people in the streets were like, oh, you're bringing art to us, to the community. And it was politicized visuals, but on the other end, it was normalized because of the activity that the function, people were used to seeing that. So uh, print actions. Um, printmaking to me is beautiful because you can print anywhere, anytime, on anything and this person wanted to be printed on so they jumped under the screen and we we did and we groups of people that i've worked with where we do these things called print actions and activities of uh, uh, a past student built this bicycle that's um amazing artwork in itself but uh it it functioned as this screen printing vehicle too that we would drive around the streets and be able to use in different functions with exhibitions. And this is at a, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at a, outside at a market. And the, the ephemera that revolves around the printed image has always been important from stickers to, these are little magnets that can be posted on metal rather than being, you know, the ability for it to not stick and to be able to be removable easily and it's not, not as invasive. So this led to other exhibitions in various forms. This was in Venice at the Biennale outside of a, a, a school gallery space. And uh, there's Hancock again and a group of artists. We printed um, Ryan O'Malley in the background here. These crowds of people who were going through to see the exhibition, some of them had never seen screen printing. So it was a unique moment of teaching, but also like this is the medium we're using to propagate, to use our, use our, our visuals and, and building installations in, in conjunction with this in the venue and then leaving prints around in spaces and doing video projection. That was another component of this. So we basically took that video around, went into some of the historic sites and left small prints in those venues. And that uh, led to another, the whole body of that work, we ended up taking it to um, Albuquerque and exhibiting this with all of the participants to create these large scale installations. And working with several artists on this started to lead me to looking into other ways of exhibiting components of these installations and interiors and other other end giving workshops along with the installations and so this i'm kind of going through these somewhat fast to 
and this led to you know thinking about scale and the purpose of what you're doing and how you're doing it and then the aesthetics became way more important than the actions for me on some levels that I was moving a little bit further away from I'm still thinking political but the reality of how do these things come together you know they're fairly large and they have components and thinking how you can make something but it could be easily shipped without a giant truck you know i can throw these roll up all of these um naga hide prints and these flat printed on paper uh, buffalo heads and unfold them and they fit in a, a small a big tube you know and a flat box and that's your whole show but you can occupy a giant gallery with the same information and do it in economy it's not going to be super expensive so that was one of the biggest things of figuring out how to do certain things on a limited budget, but also scale. And then getting into digital technology and how that functions with CNC routers, which leads to a whole other world of that's, that is not cheap. And that was like, I'm going to experiment with this. But back to what I'm doing now is combining the, these are flags that were uh, digitally printed and so just a few years ago, I was at uh, Plains Indian Museum. I did a residency at the Buffalo Bill uh, Center for the Arts. Or, and during that, it was a very unique moment because I was what, an artist on display, pretty much. So it made me think of uh, James Luna and his work and his performative pieces and then how the museum functions and how what we do as creatives. But there's also this uniqueness in teaching which we do every day we're in front of people in the public and being able to show what you do to this case museum goers thousands of people come by daily to interface with you and so there's uh, this idea of, of, of education and communication that can happen in these spaces and so I'd applied for a residency there and Hunter Old Elk um, was the one of the curators who I worked with that we would go behind in the afternoon I draw all day in the morning I would end up being in the collections and I draw from actual objects. Kiowa Comanche that she had pulled out, uh, Rebecca West is a director too of this who helped with this process. And I got to see living objects that were so empowering and powerful that, that I had never ever thought about the, the power they have. And so going into the vaults in a sense and looking and drawing from these these beautiful moccasins kiowa moccasins and comanche moccasins that were from you know the 1800s and this is a history and i was brought up traditionally not to touch these items and the way of thinking and how that revolves there was a, a realization at the time how i would actually look at them but draw from them but on the other end um, how there's kind of a, a notion of what what's the responsibility and when you're drawing from these and looking at them and then, so there was something that just really was extremely pow empowering and powerful from that so this led from the design and drawing from it to the shape of things um, this exhibition at the Missoula Art Museum and I did a residency and the designs were done on the computer so I hand drew them on a sketchbook put them on Photoshop, played with the color, dealt with what I wanted to do, and got a kind of idea. So as a sketch, it was sort of the, the purpose just on the computer from real sketches. Then I went in and worked with, with the team there, and we started to like print. And we printed probably, I think we printed 150 maybe prints. So this is a whole wall full of them. And those original ideas were a few different um, transparencies and then from there we made so many works and on paper and it was amazing to be able to come in with a team of about 14 people to just knock this out and while in Missoula the gallery director came in to look at the work and there was questions of well can what you do installation so what what are you thinking about and I was like you know I got this idea about this this whole performative space I want to blend together my music and my visuals and create it was originally a napkin but 
this is the sketchbook. And then as an artist, you modify it and you're like, okay, so I'm going to make it into a little bit more, you know, presentable drawing so that someone can look at it. And then it turned into an actual space and uh, the Missoula Art Museum took a chance and they're like, yeah, we'll do that. Let's go for it. It was just from a sketchbook or a napkin and it turned into a performance. So here's a little sample of that. I'm not opera influenced, but I am influenced by metal. <laughs> and so that screaming kind of sound of a high pitch and have, and Caitlin Mito is the singer on that. And, and she's from New York. And basically how that all happened is we ended up, I had a script that was written by my, my cousin, uh, Jason Cutnose. And these are little excerpts from that. That's part of this show, which is called bury the hatchet. That's currently at the Portland art museum and it consists of neon and also this album. So we created this record that is a two vinyl album with a CD insert that has 20 minute uh, opera component on CD that is all combined into this exhibition that happened at the Missoula Art Museum and now it's traveled to the Portland Art Museum. And here's a sample of the record, what it looks like. So this is the work that's on the wall. And Brandon Rinez was the uh, cu first curator of Bury the Hatchet when it was in, at uh, the Missoula Art Museum. And Kathleen Ash Milby is the curator of the component that's at the Portland Art Museum. And so other renditions of this have led into this at the Chazen Museum here in Madison where we did play a live show. We were supposed to play in Portland last spring, but COVID happened. So we are working on doing something similar to this that's going to happen in 2002, one coming up in the spring. Other components, this is a recent project that I just did in Madison, taking a print and wrapping uh, facilities, maintenance boxes, which now we're in COVID. So recent activity for me in trying to do any of this interactive type work has shifted and I've been able to kind of refocus my thinking and time on individual works and spending more time with them. And that this is like a new thing for me to actually have a studio practice that's not outside interacting with people and working in groups. So I'm kind of singularly working in my studio in the basement, like a makeshift studio and working on these uh, drawings. And it's almost, it's, it's been kind of amazing to be able to 
take these stacks of screen prints and drawings that I've previously made and look at them and go, hey, maybe I should add some more to them. Maybe I should do some more to them. And then all of a sudden they become <laughs> way more energetic and, and almost back to what my grandmother had said, like, go sit over there in the corner and draw. And that's what I'm doing. I'm sitting in the corner and then thinking all of the design and pattern work and all of the things that I've learned over time and putting them into it. And they've advanced into these large scale screen print and painting like ink pens on um, their boards, actually. And I'm primarily using stuff like crink pens and um, stuff that's street based art painting pens that are awesome for use. And then you saw the series of large scale prints. And this is my website. And that's it. Oh, thank you. Really good. Um, we haven't had uh, many questions, but a lot of comments in the chat. Um, a lot of like um, talking about the government cheese in Wynn, Arkansas. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, 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 Dr. Hunt says that young uh, cube. BIPOC artists more are uh, per performing on the uh, hidden and invisible numbers of QBIPOC folks dying because of the COVID plague. Yes, um, a lot of like understanding your performances in terms of like what's going on now um, out in the world. So that was that's lovely. And then uh, really liking the process from napkin to sketchbook to the artwork. Really nice. So do you think we could open it up, like just have everybody's faces and have some, some uh, conversation? That would be awesome. Maybe cool. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, this is a unique format to me because uh, to be honest, this is my first time giving a talk online like this, other than particularly just working with students and talking every day right now, which is unique because of uh, the situation with COVID and it's, it's caused a, a whole other kind of uh, thinking of how we function. Any thoughts? Renee had a question. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Renee. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Um, I, I kind of wanted to echo Jane's earlier thoughts. Jane Herodine, one of our faculty members uh, had talked about um duplicity and sort of repetition and mm -hmm. the idea of you know sort of repetition and printmaking and I also sort of just wanted to have you talk a little bit more about when you're doing installations like that where you're representing people you know just over and over and over again you know what what's kind of going through your head as you're making that work and I, I'm sure Jane can clarify also her question as well. Sure. Jane, do you want to? I'd love to hear more about all the ways this notion of multiplicity speaks and serves you and functions and uh, what it accomplishes for you. I guess uh, the function of it to me is the, the, the growing up as in a way like with this duality of trying to figure out what um, my place is and who I am, which I'm still trying to figure out at this, at this age, like, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean in a cultural aspect of, of looking at my father who who's from Michigan joins the military ends up in Lawton meets my mother, uh, my mom, my mom's uh, Kyle Comanche. And, and I remember the stories of, uh, grandpa basically mom saying that in Kiowa way he can't just come up and meet my you know her father and my grandfather but the sisters her her sisters my aunts could introduce him and so this idea of what's internalized what's externalized what's hidden what's known what do we get what don't we get what information it echoes through life. I mean, I work in the dean's office at the University of Wisconsin, and I look at that early upbringing of growing up in this environment and how that functions and its relationship to the U.S. government, to the relationship to 
the the people themselves in in, in the, the the tribal tribal mechanism to family and then how that echoes back and then also these ideas of of culture or belief systems that are unknown and they're unknown because some cultures decide that that's not uh, information that others need to know and they're internalized and those internalizations are important because they serve as a way of understanding each other that helps reinforce the beauty of who we are. It's a complicated thing, but the idea of repetition too, I look at and I see it in media culture and we, we could go off politically about so many things, but repetition has been used to do that. And what does that do and function and serve? And then also what's, what are the things that's not being said and what's not being, uh, uh, you know, the, com the conversations, what's, what's being uh, not heard or suppressed. And I, I even think about being here 20 years and watching and working, working my way into a, a leadership position so that I hopefully will continue on the hard work that someone like Truman Lowe, who was a professor here at UW-Madison, and what he instilled in me as a leader and why he took on those positions, it wasn't for him. It was for the longevity of his people, of Native people and of people of color and, and making sure that there were systems set up so that this will continue and that we've done our job. And so the caretaking of that is important. And that's one of the other things about repetition is that we've got a strength in the fact that we get more people involved with academia, with thinking about the, the larger picture and the political function and actually shifting and changing. Thank you. There was a, also, I don't, I want to give that some, a minute, but also then moving on, I was unfortunately late and I'm wondering what motivated you to, to move into um, the powerful installation work that you've done. So I never thought about this, but when uh, one of the hard questions I got early in this, this associate dean position was, what, what's your interest in being in this leadership position? And I thought, wow, you know, I don't, I'm not like, I wasn't thinking about why I was like used to doing it because of the powwow, the, the environment of, of growing up as a member of a family that says, all right, the powwow is coming on this summer. We're going to have this dance. Here's this thing. It's going to go down. You're going to have to honor these people. You're going to have to do the, the mechanism of revolving around the drum. So the drum is the core the center. It's where all the songs come from. Everybody around it has a point and a purpose. And so with that, that leadership just was almost natural because of the reality of growing up. And my grandfather saying, hey, you're going to be the water boy. I'm like, what's that? And I knew what it was because I watched other people doing it. But that point of them taking that, that vessel of water around to the singers, to the drummers, to the dancers was crucial. And that, that idea of spreading this information, this water was crucial for longevity. And so looking at the terms of what goes around any kind of protocol that, that has to do with a ceremony or with a actual event, in this case, the powwow of intertribal people coming together, that was crucial. And I think that that had to do with, it, it, it wasn't like in academic terms, an installation, it was this whole point of all of this is life. So every day is an installation, you know? And so that when I saw that I could like, wow, I could take these things and I can use the print and I can make prints with it and then I can make multiples. And then all of a sudden I create an environment and then the environment is all revolving around this. It was almost a, an extension of the, the process of making that and a process of living like that live life that as a youth of understanding it. Uh, Hello, John, I got to say this. Uh, May your day be well, may your night be well, and everything in between for you and everybody you're responsible for. When are you coming back? Coming back? Yeah. I know you ain't gone yet, but when are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good one. When are you coming back? Yeah, you got to uh, come back. One hour is not enough. It's just not uh, enough. You got to come back. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Please. This is Please. this is kind of amazing uh, uh, situation of be, of communication and and like being fortunate to have traveled to different places. And 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 the hardest part about when you leave a different like another country and you come back and you're like, how do you keep communication going? And like early on, it was Skype and things like that. But now we're in this whole new situation with new mechanisms of communication. I just, it's kind of mind blowing right now, like what, what, how we're doing things. And then also the safety awareness that's so much different. And I know that going forward, we're going to be taking this into the normal world, even if, even if we're back to normal, we're, we'll use this platform. Well, that's the question. What's back to normal? There is no normal. I would, I would say that this is the new reality. And the, what people wanted to call normal was distortion for a lot of us QPOT, BIPOC people. So we don't really like to hear the word normal or new normal. Uh, but beloved, and that is not a calling out. That's a sharing of being able to relax about trying to find something normal. <laughs> yeah. So, beloved John, I put in the chat here that you have really magnificently uh, exemplified living a three-dimensional space, I mean, reality, and putting it in two-dimensional space. This was bomb. I was looking at the clock, not for you to leave, but I was thinking, soon he's going to have to go. I don't want you to go yet. Oh, this was thank so you. exciting. Thank you. So exciting. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's such a strange thing to like. I, I watched uh, um, Tamarin did a talk with uh, Jean Quintessy Smith, and um, that was uh, uh, to me just empowering because you don't get to see this side of people in the same way because we're we're coming from like bro I'm broadcasting from my my little basement studio where there's music devices and. You know, it's like this a whole other world. And I, I love the idea of how even s some of the famous musicians that I love and respect, they're, they're broadcasting from their, their home basement studios. And some of them, you just see things uh, that, that, that you don't normally get to see. And I think that vulnerability and that insight to who we are has created a, a breakthrough with what's normal. And it's like that normalization of, of what... Like for me growing up, knowing that the U.S. government and, and its relationship and tie to the people and what it does, so many, there's so many levels to that that it's painful to think about and talk about, but it's a reality that we all live with. I, I remember getting called out by a young person in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when I did an installation there in 99 with the commodities. And he's like, why are you using those? He's like, I have to eat those. And I was like, I am using them because I ate them. I grew up eating them. Well, well, you got a job. I was like, yes, I do. I do have one. And that's why I'm in it is to help. In my young mind, then 99 was like, I'm doing this so that I can hopefully help others understand what this is about because I'm still trying to figure it out. And so me and that, he was a young guy and he was like, he's like, this is painful. I was like, I know. I'm like, I, I get it. Like, this, this sucks. And so we had a long conversation and it was an eye opener because he, he was like, I'm here visiting the gallery and, and here you are doing this work and I have to eat those when I go home. And I'm like, oh, like, and I had already just dealt with you, using those images in my work in grad school and going home and filming it in my grandparents' house and filming it. Like I remember when I moved away in undergrad in 90, uh, my grandparents making a big giant trunk full of commodities and I took those with me and that's what we ate on for the first couple months and then I took them back and I took the trunk back filled them up again so there's this idea of equity and use and what that purpose is and what it means and so there's a lot of and a lot of baggage and weight in that that's going to another world but that, that's anyway that's it's a part of it DeAndre did you have something uh, yes, thank you so much. I just wanted to take a moment out and I tried to do it at the end. Uh, but Brother John, I just had to tell you, being my roots from Tulsa, Oklahoma, graduating from the University of Oklahoma, you brought so much to me today and into this space. And I thank you, thank you, thank you. And truly to the arts and everyone who's developed this space, uh, we couldn't have had a better person. And it just felt like home listening to you. Oh. So I wanted to bring that to you. 
Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, weirdly enough, my I'm in Madison, but it's like every day you think of home. And and I live one block away from the road that drives straight down to Highway 49. It gets off right on Highway 49. So if I just have, I, I'm like thinking, you know, the world's gone crazy. I'm going to jump in the car. I'm going straight home. It's right there. And, and I'm on the furthest part of town to get closest to home in Madison. <laughs> but it makes sense to me because there's always that longing for what, what is home and where it's at and what does it mean to us. And it's important. That's beautiful. And maybe a great place to stop because it is time. I want you to, I know you're in the middle of a class. <laughs> so you might, uh, <laughs> be meeting with your class also or whatever that's happening but oh yeah i uh, yeah that was true it coincided <laughs> got to teach at the same time <laughs> thank you so much for being here i I, I um i always appreciate you and i i really thank you for um for us being your first time on on the zoom Thank you for, for allowing me to do this in the space. Like that's a, thank you all for, for being here and appreciate it. Really do. Thank you. So have a good day.